Welcome to Heroic Industries. Um, not sure if I'm going to call it Heroic Industries podcast, Heroic, I don't, I really don't like that term. Anyway, um, all right, so Heroic Industries. Welcome to Heroic Industries. Let's just call it that. So what is it? Let's talk about the scope of what this production is going to be. And uh, really, it's just a look into the mechanics of law enforcement. Um, I'll talk more about you know, why and what and how we're going to do that in a second. Um, but really, is, let's talk about um, me, honestly, and, uh, you know, why, why my opinion on any of this matters at all to you. Um, so a little background on myself. I am in my 14th year of being a police officer, and it's hard to even imagine that this is as long as I've been on this job. Um, but I started back in 07. And uh, since then, I've been involved in uh, a couple years in, in narcotics. I did some undercover work. I did a, I've done a lot of time as a patrol officer in a uniform. Um, I've done a couple of years in our gang unit. And I've also done about 10 years on our SWAT team, on our tactical team. Um, so uh, before I go any further, the views of of anything that I say here are in no way related to the views of my agency. They aren't representative of any of that. I'm not even going to say the agency that I work for. Um, so if you figure it out, you figure it out. But I will not um, put any of that on this this um, this production ever. Right? Hopefully. So uh, at least not without their permission. So um, all right. So in addition to my law enforcement, you know. Uh, things I've been involved in with that and the time I've been on the job. I also have a master's degree in psychology. Uh, I played college football and, uh, and also in the last seven, eight years have owned and operated a CrossFit affiliate on top of all my police work um, and, uh, and run that for, ran that pretty effectively until the world took a shit uh, last year. So uh, now I'm done with that and moving on to other things. And this is one of the things that, uh, that, you know, I've really been approached a lot about in the last, you know, several months, especially is the fact that uh, people are asking a lot of questions about law enforcement. And with the increase of uh, body camera footage is coming out every time you go to social media, there's a there's a new a new body camera footage of some officer involved, usually shooting or use of force or something something, some major, major incident that is now available for the world to see. And uh, in today's day and age, I think transparency is very important. And that those videos, it's just, again, my opinion is that those videos, if agencies have access to release those, uh, they need to do it sooner rather than later, always um, get those videos out. But that also comes with a downside. And the downside is that, that if you don't understand uh, things like use of force, if you don't understand um, case law, if you don't understand policy and procedure, if you don't understand state law and federal law and stuff like that. And, and then in addition to all of those things, um, if you don't understand things like physiology, things like uh, physical response, things like reaction times, um, things like state management, um, sympathetic, parasympathetic responses, like you're not going to understand the whole picture. You're going to see this, you're going to see this thing that, that is occurring. And they're usually, they're usually, you know, acts of violence and, uh, you know, good or bad, justified or unjustified. Um, and you don't know how to, how to decode it, how to, how to take it in, what it, what it all means, why it happened that way, why things went down the way they did. And that's stuff that I get act, act, asked, asked all the time uh, is, Hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And uh, I have no problem um, answering those individually, but if, if I can get some of this content out, and, uh, and answer those questions for people that are, that are curious or people that have problems with it and, you know, help people understand things better then uh, then that'd be good. Right. In addition to, and this goes back to kind of the focus and stuff like that is, is really to look at the whole conversation of training for law enforcement, training for the job. Right. Uh, and, and what it means to not just train skill sets, but actually to be able to apply it in context and actually create like better officers. Um, 
and and what what that what that all means and how do we do it how do we become more effective and efficient at making decisions and then and then uh then physically you know training training our bodies our minds our 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 souls in order to effectively become better at this job when let's face it the demands are are much much higher now than they were even a year two years five years ago the the demands for actions that we take as cops is is insane uh, the the amount of perfection that people want and you know some of it some of it is justified and some of it is, is totally unrealistic some of it is 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 actually you know like we we as cops need to really like really filter how much we push back against what society wants from us to do because in the end we are civil servants now at the same time the the society and the people at large need to understand that you can't require superhero level results from regular human beings like we don't have captain america's like uh, i i love comic books more than the average person and uh i hate to say it but none of us are superheroes Man, that really pains me to say. Um, none of us are superheroes, and you can't expect us to uh, to react and act like Captain America, Iron Man, Spider Man. Like we don't have those powers; those powers are not real. So, uh, what are the expectations? You know, and and managing the expectations, and then and then and then developing training protocols that we can really utilize to become better. You know, um, because I think we know that just training skill sets doesn't matter. You know, you can be the best shot with a, with a firearm, but if you can't apply it under stress, if you can't apply it in a sympathetic environment where you are pegged, right? And we'll talk about all these terms and stuff like that, um, but you, you're not gonna be able to hit the broad side of a barn. You're not gonna be able to effectively use that tool uh, for what it is, you know? And, and at the same time, like we've seen recently, you might mistake that tool for a different tool and then use that tool for the wrong application and all of a sudden people are dead. Um, so, you know, talking about in incidents like that and, and looking at the videos and really breaking things down, uh, from that standpoint, because there's a lot of people that are, that are breaking these things down, but they're breaking it down based on is it justified or unjustified use of force. And then when it comes out that it is justified, there, there is a lot of people that don't understand why it's justified. And, uh, and that includes police officers that 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 really includes police officers too so that you know this is informational for everybody but you know it will also hopefully make the standard of the job more professional and and um, and everything that comes with it so there you go um all right that's kind of background on me that's kind of a uh, focus of what the show is going to be and um now let's kind of get into the first example, honestly. Um, so let's just bring it up. All right. So this let's share screen here. Boom. All right. Okay. So this here. This here is an example. It's a, this is a prime example of. Uh, of something good, right? Something really good. Like it, it's a horrible, you know, thing that, that the police had to take action and, and use lethal force against a subject. Um, but you know, this is, this is a good police response. This is what you can expect. Your, what you should expect from your police officers. Um, all right. So I don't, I don't know the entire backstory in this. I believe this is out in California and, uh, LA potentially. Um, but don't, you know, don't take my word on it. I just found it on social media. I thought it was a great example of, of something we can use to uh, look at for episode one. Um, so I'm just going to roll this and break it down as we go. All right. Well, there's our cool logo. Look at that. I threw that on there too. Uh, so what you just heard was uh, was some either some tear gas or a less lethal round being fired through a window. All right. Um, so you can see that's a shotgun. Uh, you can see that that is uh, that's that's a, a either a, like a ferret round or a less lethal round that they use to to fire through a window, um, and this is a barricaded subject with a with a weapon with a firearm. Okay, so you heard a gunshot, and you see 
the, the SWAT officer go down here, right? So he gets hit. Run is down. 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 So that's the entire view from that team. So that team was a perimeter team more than likely. And again, I, I don't know the exact details. I'm making some assumptions based on my experience, right? But uh, so, you know, they're, they're initiating a, an assault on this barricaded subject. And again, I don't know why. I don't, I don't know what, what prompted that, right? There could be a whole number of reasons why that happened. But what, what do you see? You see, you see an, a stressful act take place that was already in a stressful environment. Now it's hyper, hyper stressful. And so it's sympathetic is the term, right? So you have two branches of your, uh, of your nervous system. Sympathetic, which is your fight or flight response, and your parasympathetic, which is your rest and digest, you know, sleep type deal, right? So now you, you've activated, super activated the sympathetic side. And, uh, and you can hear that on the radio, right? So this guy, you know, like, is very frantic on the radio. Hey, you know, one of my one of our guys is shot, and uh, communicates that, but then manages to collect himself, figure out what needed to be done, and drag his partner out of harm's way. You know, in order for the uh, the other teams to take action on on what they needed to do, which we'll see here right now. Oh, yeah. Hey. Don't fucking move! Don't move! Don't reach for that rifle! Do not reach for that rifle! Yeah, he's down. Stop the hands on him! So this is another team obviously coming up to go hands on and cuff, right? Okay. All right. So let's let's continue to talk about the um, the you know sympathetic parasympathetic you know, deal for just a second. This, this goes into the, the breathwork protocols, uh, state management. Like how do you go into that state where, where it's extreme stress? Like you're, you're literally talking life and death. You're having a gunfight with a guy. And then, um, how do you, how do you train yourself so that you can maintain a state that you can actively like communicate what happened to other people that you're working with and then, and then take action to stop further bad things from happening, you know, just like freak out and run away or freak out and freeze in place. You know, how do you, how do you do that? Right. And a lot of that is, is um, controlling your state. Right. And when we talk about state, we'll get into that later too. Um, maybe not in this episode, but you know, like how far do you go on one way or the other with your, your sympathetic parasympathetic or sympathetic responses. Right. Um, okay. So, when we talk about the, the mechanics of what occurred here, you saw the officer uh, with the rifle in his hand, um, <laughs> holding it in one arm and dragging his, his partner, his, his teammate, dragging him further away from the threat area, right? Um, so immediately I looked at that and I was like, all right, that, lo that looks a whole lot like a backward sled drag. Um, and this is what I thought, right? So if you study powerlifting, if you know anything about that, then you understand that a, a big part of that is taking like a day throughout the week where you're doing carries, pushes, and pulls with sleds. And uh, it, it's really, really good for posterior chain activation. It's really good for, uh, you know, uh, just utilizing force production without an eccentric load. So it's going to eliminate you know, the uh, excessive soreness, it's going to be decompressive, it's going to be a good recovery piece. Uh, but you can also use it for like overloading and doing heavy, heavy sled drags for shorter distances. Um, what I talked about, you know, just a, a second ago, using it for recovery piece is going to be like a mile sled drag with lightweight where you're walking, you know, um, very, very common with power lifters, it's really, really good for all those things I just said. But you, all, you can also do it backwards, right? So when you go backwards, you go heel to toe, and uh, Louis Simmons talks about this at length, that he believes that the backward sled drag is what saved his knees from being needed to be replaced. 
Um, so when you're talking about dragging a person, it's really just a sled. And when you're talking about holding a rifle, it's really just a front rack archetype, right? So you can take a kettlebell, a dumbbell, something, something in your arm, put it in your arm, and then work a sled drag backwards, and you're really replicating that entire movement that we saw just a second ago, right? So from a biomechanics standpoint, it looks really the same or pretty damn close to this. So just check this out. So you can see we got the front rack archetype there, boom, comes up in that front rack position. And then the other one is just getting looped around the arm. And then you can go as heavy or as light as you want on this. And uh, that's all we got. All right, so um, stop share, there we go. All right, so um, it, that's, that's what that looks like, okay? Um, so you can see, you just have to start looking at shapes, right? So with this, we saw, a backward sled drag is what we saw. Dragging a person's no different really than dragging an object or dragging a sled or you know doing anything else like that. Um, it, from, a, from a mechanic standpoint, you're doing the same thing. So to train, right? To train, you got to look at, you know, uh, some, like drags and carries, right? Drags and carries are a huge part of what we do. And if you're not implementing drags and carries, then you're missing a huge part of, of training physically for the job that we have, right? And um, let, let's, talk, let's talk about functionality. Like, what do we do? Like, what, what do these do for us, right? Um, if you talk about carrying things, right? So you saw me take that kettlebell up in a front rack position. Um, that's a farmer carry, right? That's a front rack farmer carry. Uh, and it's really the same as taking a rifle and moving here, right? Or taking anything and moving it in your hands, pulling it to yourself and, and moving. That is a front rack carry. Um, so you got to train it, right? We have weapon systems that are external to us, uh, shotguns, rifles, whatever, long guns. Those are all, that's all front rack archetype here, right? Boom, front rack, front rack, front rack, front rack. Front rack. So you got to train something in that, in that shape, or, or you're missing a huge component. You're not going to have the strength to do what you need to do. You're not going to have the range of motion to do what you need to do. Um, so it, it's very, very, very critical that you do carries. Uh, additionally, if you look at just the gear that you wear every day, your, your vest, your belt, your boots, like anything else that you have to wear, um, those are all external loads and it's really the same as a farmer carrier. So every time you are in your car or you get out of your car, you're wearing, you know, what, 10, eight to 10 to 15 pounds, depending on how much shit you wear, uh, extra to you and anywhere you walk, that is basically a farmer carry to a, to a certain point where this gear is going to be the same as, as carrying extra weight right? Extra weight. So that, that really is the same as a farmer carry. So you got to train carrying stuff because it's like, that's the basic, the most basic thing that we do is carry things. That's the, the most likely thing that you're going to do on the job is carry things, right? You do that when you get out of your car every single day, you've got that external loading. Okay. Um, and also, so we, we got to talk about imbalances, and injuries and the fact that cops notoriously have uh terrible hips terrible lower backs right those are the two big ones and then that is exacerbated by ankle issues from wearing boots and sitting in flexion like i am now uh like this and you know i, I posted some other stuff on my on my social media about that too where you know you're sitting in flexion all damn day and that puts you in such a bad spot right and and we're usually like cockeyed to one side, sitting and you know, like trying to get off that gun and then typing on a computer maybe that doesn't move. Uh, so you're all kind of off kilter with your spine. Um, so training carries in the gym setting is going to do wonders to fix those imbalances. So, so sitting like we do all day is going to create imbalances. When we train carries, we are fixing the imbalance. So um, strong fit, if you follow them, you should. Um, they talk about this a lot. 
that every time you're carrying a yoke, carrying, uh, you know, kettlebells, dumbbells, farmer carries, farmer carry handles, uh, front rack, mixed grips, you, you, it's limited by your imagination with this, right? Uh, but every time that you do this, that you transport an, an item, a heavy item from one side of, of an area to another, point A to point B, you are uh, fixing imbalances by the fact when you pick one foot up off the ground, you have to stabilize and adjust and create uh, create these, these micro adjustments in your core, in your spine, in your stabilizers, and in your big movers too, because it's heavy. Uh, so you're doing all of those things every single step, right? So you, we've got to correct the imbalances that we get from working, right? We don't wear our gear evenly. Uh, you know, a gun is heavier than a radio or heavier than a taser. So it's going to be like shifted like that. And then we're going to sit weird and we're going to stay there for hours on end sometimes. And then all of a sudden we got to get up and move quickly. Okay. Um, so imbalances are going to be a thing that the job creates and we got to undo the bad time. And to do that, we, we got to do some carries and we got to do some drags. So every time you're walking, moving, uh, with weight, with load, like you will start to correct those imbalances and, and you'll just do it naturally. And you don't have to worry about like knowing everything. That's another thing. Like it, it's, it's, it's relatively dummy proof because of the fact that, uh, you don't have to know like, oh, I've got to do this to create this, like to work the oblique sling and these crossbody deadlifts and all this other shit that is really good and it's really valid. But at the same time, like just pick a weight up, get two heavy dumbbells and heavy is relative for you. Pick them up and move them around, right? Do short sprints with them, do long walks with them, do, do medium length. It doesn't matter. You just got to pick them up and move them from point A to point B, set them down, rest, pick them up and move them again. Simple, right? Not easy. Jocko willing, but simple. So uh, you got to do it, right? That's going to create the imbalances. So figure out a way to work carries into it. That's like the, you know, the, the most basic thing we do every damn day. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, drags, we saw drags move. You got to move people and things quickly. You know what I mean? Like that is, that is a necessity of our job. You got to, you got to move people and things quickly. And, uh, and then figure it out and then move them again and figure it out, move them again. Now you might never face something that was that uh, intense as what we just saw uh, that you might never have that, but you're going to have something that's going to look like that at some point where you're going to have to drag a person or, uh, or, a, I don't know, a person on a cot, maybe, maybe it's as easy as like, you know, you've got to like drag, help drag some, some, uh, some, person up a, a steps. I had that, you know, the other day where there was some lady that was like broke her hip and she was down in a basement for, for two days straight. And I had to help medics drag her up the steps. You know, that's the same type of deal. You got to drag or move something or someone from point A to point B. And are you going to be able to be prepared to do it? Right. So drags and carries are, are critical with that. All right. Um, okay. So going back to some of our parasympathetic parasympathetic discussion and state, uh, you can you can really utilize your aerobic system with this. So you know, one thing that we're going to talk about a lot is is not just state, but how to stay in a low gear. And as much as we all love to just go hard, and it is very important that you got to go hard um, on the job, and you got to be able to train hard for the job but you also have to know how to train at a low intensity in order to activate your aerobic system on a, on a low level, right? Cause you got to build a low base before you can build that high base. Otherwise it's just, it doesn't work well. You'll never be able, you'll always redline. And when you redline, you make bad choices, right? So sometimes you need a red line. You need to hit that red line hard. Like the heart rate goes up, everything spikes, hard sympathetic shift, but you can't stay there and you can't live there, right? So walking and dragging for extended periods of time is going to be able to build your low base aerobic system. And that is so important. Um, you can only develop yourself with as much volume as possible by having a solid volume and, and solid, solid base of aerobic strength. Like you've got to have that. And uh, so example, right? You can take a sled out for a 20 minute walk walk right so you are dragging weight on a 20 minute walk and you're probably going to sweat but you should be able to maintain nasal breathing and if you get on my instagram 
you know, or, or the heroic industries, Instagram, you can see that type of training and uh, you've got to be able to access your nasal breathing in order to build your aerobic base as, as, as well as you can. And I'm telling you, I can assure you that while it is not the sexiest type of training, it will impact your ability to maintain a lower state and not go so sympathetic when you really need to make good decisions. You'll be able to bring yourself back down because you've spent more time at a low level and, and you understand where you got to get back to. If you only ever train going hard, you're only ever going to understand either completely off or completely on. And, and that, that light switch effect is not uh, sustainable. And it, you really see some errors in thinking because you go from like no stress to all the stress. And that's the only way you know how to train. It's the only way you know how to respond. It's the only way it doesn't work, right? It doesn't. Um, so, all right. Last thing I want to say about, uh, go, we got to talk about this is that uh, flushing the knee, right? So the backwards sled drags, not only is it good because you're probably going to drag somebody backwards, right? You're going to move backwards like we saw. Uh, so that's important to be able to move a heavy load a short distance really fast. But when you talk about, again, going 20 minutes, working your nasal breathing, working your state management, but also going backwards with that, like you are working terminal extension of the knee. That means that, that when the knee presses out, it presses all the way out and, uh, and, and you flush the knee joint. And that can really do wonders. Like Louis Sim has talked about, like I already mentioned, he, he claims that, that those backwards sled drags are the reason that he has not needed knee replacements. And, uh, and there's a lot of other people like this knees over toes guy that's out now. He's worked with Mark Bell and some other like high level athletes. Um, he talks about that where it's like, he's had partial knee replacements and now he can still do all these, all these different things because he's, he talks about backwards walking. He talks about, um, you know, I think some sled drags and then really working some deep lunges, getting into those knees. Um, but it's all kind of the same, same style of conversation with that, where we got to get those knees flushed out in order to do that. If we just, if we don't ever work full range of motion with these things, um, and we don't ever work loading in, in these, in these patterns, then your knees aren't going to get better. They're actually going to get way worse as we get older, obviously. Um, so how do we maintain that integrity of the knee? Uh, you utilize a bunch of backward walking and a bunch of backward sled drags. And, um, those are, those are some good guys to look up. Lou Simmons, backward sled drags or sled drags in general, West side, uh, you know, um, West side barbell and conjugate method and stuff like that is very, very applicable for, for police work and strength gains. And definitely they talk more about sled drags than anybody. It's where I learned my stuff was from, um, uh, CrossFit conjugate and Shane sweat. Um, which he's a direct descendant of Louis Simmons himself did all his training with Louis. So it's, it's really just the same information, uh, that, that he got. And then, uh, again, you know, knees over toes. If you just search him on YouTube, he's got tons of content. And if you've got knee problems, it's a great thing to add in. And if you don't do it, um, and you want to be able to be effective for the job and effective for your life and, and be able to train pain freaks. So like, these are all things, carries and drags are things that, that you need to utilize in order to train pain-free. And then you can go to work pain-free, hopefully, because we're training pain-free. And, uh, you know, like it, it's a huge component of not just the job, but longevity with training. So you've got to look at that as, as well, too. So, um, yeah. All right. That's it. That's what we got today. That's the scope of this show. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. If you have questions, um, you can email me and, uh, you can find that somewhere. I'll attach it somewhere. You can email me with direct questions. If you got stuff that you want to go over, if you have stuff that you don't understand, if you're like not a cop, um, and, and you got questions about cop stuff, let me know. And I can address them. Uh, if you've got it, if you've got training questions, cops, non-cops, like uh, civilians, whatever, don't care. Right. Um, the training that we go over is going to be geared towards law enforcement. But again, like when you talk about decision-making, <laughs> you know, and training, it's good for everybody. The better decision-makers we have in society as a whole, the better we're going to be, right? And, and that's always the scope. The scope of law enforcement is to make society better, right? Um, so 
there you go. All right, until next time, stay safe out there. Yeah.